Today's panel will be on fisheries and aquaculture, and I'll be moderating it. Uh, my name's Ivana, and I'm a PhD student here at MIT in the Mechanical Engineering Department. Uh, so Dr. Briggs, earlier today in his keynote speech, really set up um, the transition from the meat panel that we previously had to the fisheries and aquaculture panel quite well. Um, he really focused on sort of meat consumption and production globally and then talked about increasing fish as a protein um, in terms of consumption as an alternative uh, to meat consumption from an environmental standpoint. And so today what we're gonna do is dive a little more into the issues of fisheries and aquaculture. Um, we could have an entire summit on this topic itself. It's very broad, it's very complex, but we'll try to cover a couple issues with regard to regional and global trends, and some of the main sustainability issues. And with that, I'll turn it over to my panelists. They're going to introduce themselves and share some preliminary thoughts um, on the topic before we dive into questions. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good to be here. Uh, my name is Guillermo Herrera. I'm a, uh, an economics professor at Bowdoin College, and I primarily identify as a bioeconomist, which means I study the interaction between humans and dynamic natural systems, fisheries in particular. Um, and today I'm just going to lay out some of the basics about capture fisheries, a little bit about aquaculture, sort of challenges that capture fisheries face, some potential uh, solutions or innovations, and then hand it over to the aquaculture experts. We have several here. So, um, so first of all, capture fisheries uh, globally are about 100 million metric tons. That's roughly a third of uh, what we call land meat. Uh, and that puts it global capture fisheries are about on a par with poultry production, a little more than beef production, just to give you a sense of scale. It's about 26 pounds of seafood per person per year globally. Um, uh, there are areas in the world where that's much higher, uh, East Asia, Scandinavia, the Iberian Peninsula all consume a lot more fish than the average. Um, the other interesting thing about um, uh, fish consumption is, is much less tethered to income. It's much less income dependent. There's a strong, uh, almost linear dependency between meat consumption and income, and fisheries is much less uh, income correlated, which means that, <coughs> therefore, that it's much more, relatively speaking, much more important to less affluent consumers, to the poor. Um, the growth of capture fisheries has, uh, capture fisheries have grown about threefold since 1950. Uh, what's interesting is that almost all of that happened before 1995. After 1995, capture fisheries plateaued uh, pretty much. And the other thing to note about the, that aggregate metric, uh, I'm a microeconomist, so aggregate metrics are always a little suspect to me, but that, that aggregate metric really takes the form of many sequential decimations of fish stocks over time, from the sperm whale to the, the um, Pacific sardine to the uh, Pacific ground fish to the around here Atlantic cod. So um, it's not as pleasant a story as that upward uh, trend in, in total production might look. Um, global total combined seafood production has gone up fourfold since 1960. Uh, so there's been a dramatic growth in seafood, seafood production. Um, but really since 1990, that's been driven by an explosion in aquaculture production, about six and a half fold uh, increase in, in global aquaculture production since 1990. Um, and right around 2012, depends how you measure things, but right around 2012, aquaculture, which has grown convexly, caught up to the concave growth of capture fisheries, and they roughly were equal in 2012, and aquaculture has now surpassed capture fisheries in terms of total volume. Um, we are sort of at peak fish. Uh, the UN FAO says that, that 70 to 90 percent, again, depending on how you measure, of uh, global fisheries are either fully fished or overfished. So um, it's not clear how much more production we can wring out of the, the capture fishery, per se. Okay, so there are some challenges facing uh, global uh, capture fisheries. Uh, I'm an economist, so I like to focus on the dismal first. Um, so, <laughs> so um, these systems are at risk. They're at risk primarily because of uh, imperfect property rights, or poor property rights. Um, basically, what that means is we own what we take out of the water. It's on our boat. We can sell it. We don't own any of the benefits of being prudent about that extraction. So if we leave a fish in the water to grow, even if it's going to grow by 30% or 40% over the next year, uh, we completely discount that production in, in the system because we don't own it. It's kind of like if somebody else has the pin to your ATM card. You're more likely to take that money out now and spend it. Um, 
There are other risk factors. The, the, the fish that you see in the background here is sort of the poster child for, for market failure in fisheries. It's a bluefin tuna. Um, fish that are slow growing, fish that are valuable, fish that are slow to mature and reproduce, and especially fish that move uh, among, between national jurisdictions or that occupy the high seas where, where really there are no property rights are particularly at risk of, of over-exploitation. That property rights problem is particularly acute. Um, there's a phenomenon known as IU fishing, which stands for illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. That's a huge problem worldwide. Um, something on the order of 10 to 25 million metric tons of fish are caught illegally every year. So that constitutes 15 to 25 percent or so of uh, global fish capture. And in some places, that's far worse. In West Africa, for example, they estimate over 40 percent of fish is illegally caught. It's hard to get a hard number on that because it's illegal, so there's not good data. Um, something like 20 to 30 percent of fish that's brought into the U.S., imported into the U.S., is thought to be illegal capture. So um, that's a big problem. There's some things being done to address it. Uh, there, there's an interesting sort of ironic twist about capture fisheries. Uh, increases in demand, there's increases in value, interest in consuming seafood, and technological advances in the capture technology, uh, which in a normal production setting would be beneficial. They'd be a source of wealth generation. In the fisheries context, they're actually undesirable. They're, they're actually, they drive uh, accelerated depletion of the stock. So they can kind of amplify the market failures. If people develop better boats in order to race out and catch the last few remaining fish, it kind of just accelerates the process. Um, there are some other drivers of, of problems in fisheries, not to dwell on this, but, but climate change is obviously an issue. Fish stocks have, are now all of a sudden maladapted to where they live and they have to move and that disrupts economic systems as well as ecological systems. Um, habitat destruction, mangroves, mangroves and coral reefs are being eroded and so that's habitat for, for fisheries. Um, there's the issue of bycatch and discarding. Uh, that's another n gargantuan number, something like 28 to 30 million metric tons of fish are caught and thrown away at sea, and that, you know, 90 percent of that, that fish is dead. So it's a loss to the system. It's thrown up due to regulations or, um, or due to lack of markets or other things. So it's a, it's a giant problem in the, in the fishery industry. Um, and then there's destructive fishing, which you think of, think of things like di dynamite or si uh, ar uh, arsenic fishing or cyanide fishing or uh, trawl gear that uh, damages the underlying benthic habitat and reduces the carrying capacity of these stocks. So um, a lot of doom and gloom. Uh, and the, uh, the last point I'll make on this, on this note is the, uh, that regulation of these systems is very hard. We know that th these systems are overfished. We know in many cases we should have fewer people fishing or less capital in the fisheries. Uh, it is um, very difficult once people are in a fishery and established as participants and see it as part of their heritage. The Gulf of Maine is a prime example of this. Uh, it's very, very difficult to uh, get people to leave. There's a lot of adversity between uh, between the harvesters and the, and the regulators in those systems. Okay, now on to a little bit of uh, brightness, happiness. I put on my biology hat because I was once a biologist. Uh, so there's some, there's some re exciting innovations and reasons to be a little hopeful about at least some capture fisheries. Uh, rationalization of fisheries and all that means is assigning uh, individually owned rights to exert effort or rights to take fish out of a system are, are known now empirically to reduce uh, over-exploitation of fisheries. Chris Costello and a group at Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, did a big meta-analysis of a thousand commercial fisheries worldwide and showed a very significant impact uh, of, of rationalization or cat, what they call catch shares, individually owned catch shares on the probability of collapse. They reduce the probability of collapse. So that's a that's a uh, definitely a promising avenue. Um, we are more and more economists, that is, more and more are partnering with ecologists and other natural scientists to, to really understand the nuances of these harvested systems. Um, for example, some of the work that I'm doing is on spatial dynamics of resources. And we now understand that if you can regulate where people fish and not just how much they fish, uh, you can uh, achieve dramatically better effects, right? Not just uh, biologically, not just economically, but also politically, because it turns out you don't need to kick as many people out of the fishery if you do things in the right way spatially. Uh, and um, you can do that, for example, through marine protected areas. Uh, there's a, there's a big initiative now to close the high seas to fishing altogether. This is uh, Rashid Sumaila, the, the IUU people, and a group at University of British Columbia are pushing for a high seas fisheries closure. And it's, it's on the table as a real kind of international collaboration. Um, bringing the participants into the system, just uh, in light of the last point, is very promising. Um, 
the, lo the main lobster co-management organization is an example of this, or, or system is an example of this. If you actually enfranchise the participants and have them be part of the rulemaking process, you increase their confidence in the information that the regulations are based on. You get a lot more buy-in, a lot more compliance, a lot le less political pushback. Okay, and we, we say it improves the optics of the regulatory process. Um, and then finally, uh, obviously, there's all of this, these, the doom and gloom begs the question of should we have commercial fisheries at all? Does it make sense? If it, it's, I think it's interesting to look on land and think we don't have a commercial hunting uh, industry. There is no market, I mean, with the exception of you can go to northern Maine probably and buy a venison burger or a Minnesota and buy, you know, buy a, a moose burger, but, but you can't, uh, you don't, in general, see in the grocery store wild-caught terrestrial animals, birds, quadrupeds, rodents. Anything. You don't see any of them in the grocery store. So it's interesting to ask why that is, you know, what the, <coughs> the, the, why we have it in the ocean, we don't have it in, on land. I'm not proposing it, that we uh, abandon c capture fisheries entirely, but it is an interesting question. Um, so, but aquaculture is clearly uh, an alternative, and I'll leave it to the discussion as to, to whether it's, it's a substitute for commercial fisheries or whether it's some kind of complement to commercial fisheries. I, I, I describe it here as an escape valve. Uh, it's a place for fishermen, displaced fishermen, to go and do something that's related to what they were doing. It's a similar way of life in a way. Um, so it has its own sets of issues. They will be discussed, I'm sure, at length here. And I'll stop there, probably over my time a lot. So. Great, thank you, Ta. Uh, next up, um, Wally will be talking about um, the Global Aquaculture Alliance. OK, good morning, uh, or yes, yeah, still good morning. Uh, I'm Wally Stevens. I'm the executive director of the Global Aquaculture Alliance. It's a trade association who focuses on education, training, advocacy, and demonstration for practices that result in responsible aquaculture. Uh, I've been doing this for the last 10 years since having flunked retirement. Um, and it's really an exciting space to be in. But it's a very responsible uh, challenge that we face uh, as practitioners, as advocates for aquaculture to do things better, to produce more uh, more seafood. Uh, our product uh, is really assurances. The marketplace, which is the best manager of change that I know about, um, is looking for assurances on both fisheries and on their aquaculture products. Whether it's wild caught or whether it's farmed, they're looking for assurances. Assurances that the animals that come to them have been grown in a responsible way from an environmental point of view, that the animal's welfare has been uh, addressed more and more. It's social welfare uh, on fishing vessels or on vessels that land feed that go into fish meal and fish oil, and that it's safe food. So those are the four pillars that we work on to provide assurances to the marketplace. I've listed here some logos of marketplace forces that, frankly, we report to. Um, these are the folks, for whatever reasons, whatever agendas they may have, care deeply about sustainability. Uh, by far, uh, the biggest driver of sustainability in aquaculture is a small company by the name of Walmart. Um, they talk a talk, and they walk a walk. Uh, they have expectations for their suppliers that they enforce. Uh, they're about one of uh, the many folks that we work with. I think the other interesting marketplace force that we're dealing with today is something called e-commerce, particularly in China, and the amount of product that is reaching that marketplace and those consumers um, through e-commerce. <clears throat> we just came back from a meeting in Qingdao, China, last week, and the Chinese believe that they will consume by 2023 as much seafood as the rest of the world combined. Oh, so if you want to think about markets, if you want to think about markets and, and the issues that they care about, I suggest that's probably where we need to focus a, a lot of our, uh, our attention. Um, a little bit uh, about uh, aquaculture is growing at better than 5% growth rate per year. There aren't many manufacturing businesses I know about that are growing uh, in, with that type of growth. We certify about 4% of the aquaculture production total 
certification of aquaculture by third party groups is maybe 5%. <laughs> Long way to go to get an aquaculture industry to a better, better place. We're on a journey. We need to accept that fact that, that we uh, are on that journey. Um, Saltwater production is about two thirds of global uh, production. Freshwater is really your tilapia, your carp, and of course, um, more and more of the aquaculture isn't fed. Uh, let's take seaweed as one of the fastest growing segments of, uh, of aquaculture. I, I, I would kind of close my remarks by saying that aquaculture has not met the expectations that those of us in the industry uh, or the marketplace had for it 10, 15, 20 years ago. We thought aquaculture would provide us with a predictable supply of product. We thought it would provide us with a predictable cost for that product, and it has not done that. And it has not done that for two really important reasons. Um, disease is still the major factor that restricts investor interest in this aquaculture space. Availability of feed and, and the um, ability to balance on a very targeted basis fish meal and fish oil uh, and alternatives to that in feed uh, have been a major challenge. And really technology and the practices and the equipment and the systems that we need in order to do technology more predictable, more predictably. So I suggest that there's opportunity for those of you in this audience who are go to MIT uh, with focus on technology to think about getting involved with, in a solutions basis, the challenges, disease, feed, uh, the technology that we require, whether it's land-based technology, open ocean, technology, this is a relatively new industry. There's room at the table for bright young men and women and some old duffers like myself <coughs> to have a place to shape the future of, of a very, very important source of, of, of feed. Uh, in the United States, we don't do much with aquaculture. We produce about 1% of the global uh, production of, of aquaculture. From a food security point of view, you know, you think about the beef program that came on prior to this, other poultry, other programs. From a food security point of view, the United States is very secure in all of its food except something called fish and, and, uh, and seafood. So technology can change that. Technology can change where we do what we do, but we need the technology. We need to learn. We need to be comfortable with, with, with learning and not thinking that there's some switch that we're just going to flip a switch and all of a sudden we're going to have all of the answers. It doesn't work that way. So I'm delighted to, to be here. I'm looking forward to the rest of the panel and hearing uh, your questions and, and maybe we can even get into some of the issues that aquaculture always seems to uh, bring to the forefront. Great. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, next up, we have Robert Jones from the Nature Conservancy. Yeah, thanks, Ivana. Thanks, Wally. Um, <clears throat> aquaculture, I think, is one of the most misunderstood forms of food production from an environmental perspective. Uh, I'm Robert Jones. I'm the global lead for aquaculture at the Nature Conservancy. Some of you uh, probably have heard about our organization. We're one of the largest environmental organizations in the world. We have 3,500 people working in 69 countries around the world. And we've recently gone through a major strategic planning process in which we're pivoting or reshaping our mission as an organization. We're now focusing more on the intersection of people and nature rather than just nature for nature's sake. And our new mission is to address the biggest challenges facing nature and people by the year 2050. Um, it's no surprise that providing food and water sustainably has risen as one of our top priorities. And within that priority, fisheries and aquaculture is one of our highest priorities. And for the reasons we're going to discuss today, aquaculture is a new and important priority. I think the way we're approaching the sector is different than when uh, a lot of the NGOs uh, have approached aquaculture in the past. Um, in the past, many NGOs have approached aquaculture as exclusively an environmental challenge and exclusively a threat to the environment. Um, and that's true. As aquacul it is a challenge. Uh, 
as aquaculture grows, uh, it's the fastest growing form of food production. It's going to impact more areas of the world. And um, it has the potential to do environmental damage. Um, but that's only part of the story. Um, let's think about aquaculture in a broader food production context. Um, if there wasn't farming of seafood, think about the pressures that we would have on wild stocks. Uh, aquaculture is an alternative way of producing seafood protein. Uh, our wild resources are already stretched, and aquaculture provides an alternative. Um, but also, even thinking broader about seafood in the context of global meat production, aquaculture stacks up very well against other animal agriculture, uh, other forms of animal agriculture production from a resource efficiency perspective. It takes far less feed, fresh water, land production to produce a pound of fish than it does to produce a pound of beef, poultry, uh, or pork. So there are compelling reasons to increase the amount of seafood that we have in our diets. Shifting from beef, consuming beef to consuming vegetables is probably the best, but also shifting from beef consumption to fish consumption gets you part of the way there. So this is one of the reasons we're interested in aquaculture. Um, if we're thinking about the unfed species that are produced through aquaculture, that is shellfish like bivalves and seaweed, this is of particular interest to us because they might actually be closest to zero input form of food production you can get. They actually require no feed, no fresh water, no land, no fertilizers. And there are some inherent and interesting, interesting aspects of these species. Um, bivalves filter water. Um, seaweeds extract and soak up nutrients. Um, we live in a time where 60% of the waterways in the United States are experiencing excess nutrients and eutrophication. We potentially could use commercial aquaculture as a market-based solution towards accelerating or complementing traditional restoration efforts. So that's something we're looking into. Um, of course, I don't want to make this sound like it's all roses. And just look at the slide behind me. You know, these challenges are real. This is probably conservationists' worst nightmare in terms of aquaculture being done in a way um, that is not sustainable. This is kind of the tragedy of the commons realized here with everyone kind of just setting up shop wherever they choose and no planning whatsoever. This is not good for the environment. It's uh, too many farms in too close proximity, bad for habitats, bad for the benthic environment. Um, this is a reason why disease is so pre prevalent in aquaculture. Um, can we go to the next slide? I have a second slide. But there's things to be excited about in aquaculture. So this is like, that was one extreme in China, and this is another extreme. This is a new and innovative way of producing seafood in the offshore environment. Incredibly technology intensive. This is not really at a <laughs> stage of commercial viability yet, but this is something cool to be excited about. This is uh, actually the inside of that cage you see at the top of the screen. Um, that's an offshore pen. And there's a couple of next to it. And the bottom part of the slide is the inside of that, that offshore pen. And the scuba diver there is my friend Brian O'Hanlon, who started that farm. And uh, this is just an amazing image. Like, you know, that water is so clean you can swim in it. And, you know, that's, this is probably uh, one of the things that you can, we can be most excited about. In reality, um, we're going to need to produce fish from aquaculture in a variety of different ways, not just offshore in these environments far away from the coast, but also on land, on tanks, uh, in ponds, and uh, in the coastal environment carefully as well. Um, so uh, just to conclude, um, there is a lot of big challenges with aquaculture right now. And it's not just the environmental ones. It's the economic ones, which challenge this type of aquaculture. It's also the social ones. We're talking about interactions with wild fisheries as well and coastal landowners. These are also challenges we need to talk about. Um, but there's lots of stuff to be excited about. And um, for the students out there, if you're looking for a sector to get involved with that's up and coming, uh, a business opportunity that has the potential to provide environmental and social returns, uh, aquaculture is a really interesting place to be right now. So thanks a lot. Great. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, last, we have Anne from Dartmouth. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm Ann Kapuscinski. I'm a professor of sustainability science in the environmental studies program at Dartmouth. I moved there in 2009 and at that time actually decided to sort of shift the focus of my research. Prior to then, I, since probably about the early 1980s, had primarily focused on genetic issues, especially around the intersection of aquaculture and fisheries, everything from genetic impacts of, stacking, of stocking hatchery raised salmon to restore wild populations to uh, selective breeding and genetic engineering and aquaculture and the ecological risk questions uh, that that posed as well as the opportunities. Uh, but I decided as I was watching uh, the explosive growth of aquaculture that some of our um, other panel members have referred to, I decided that I wanted to sort of shift my work to uh, approaching a solution that might help steer aquaculture uh, in a sustainable direction. And uh, I, I learned from the literature that the feeds are really a key leverage point um, as aquaculture continues to develop and, um, and, and industrializes. If you look at the life cycle analyses that have been done of aquaculture feeds, you see that the trend they tend to show is that uh, the main contribution to greenhouse gas emissions of aquaculture comes really from the feed inputs. It's not so much the operations at the aquaculture farm, but it has to do with the fossil fuels that are used to basically go in the ocean and hunt for the fish, uh, the issues that Ta was talking about. Uh, and then also, also the processing of rendering uh, these pelagic or forage fisheries into uh, fish meal and fish oil. Also on the downstream end, the biggest contributions uh, to eutrophication potential is from diets that are not um, adequately digested uh, by the fish, so they do release some phosphorus and nitrogen. Now, before I go any further, it's important to uh, make clear that these impacts of aquaculture are definitely at a much smaller scale than what we're seeing from terrestrial livestock uh, um, agriculture. So I agree with what uh, you were just saying, Robert, that aquaculture really does offer a lot of potential. But I see that we're really at an important pivot moment where we need to do everything we can to steer aquaculture in a sort of more deeply sustainable direction, and especially one that sort of takes a systems approach. So click. So uh, my lab uh, has decided uh, and we have the last few years been focusing uh, really like a laser beam on uh, marine microalgae. We sort of almost by accident discovered that some marine microalgae are more digestible by a, one of the most important farmed freshwater fish, tilapia, uh, than freshwater microalgae. And then that got us really going on uh, working with marine microalgae. Uh, the pictures I have on the slide here now that just came up are to sort of get across that people tend to forget that marine microalgae are at the base of the ocean food web. And it turns out that they are the planet's main synthesizers of those really healthy omega-3 fatty acids. So the reason why it's good for you to eat sardines, and that's a picture there of a can of wild sardines that I eat quite often, and the reason why it's desirable for you to eat salmon is because the omega-3 fatty acids uh, that are in the marine microalgae move up the food web and get bioconcentrated in the oils of these fish. What's happening presently is that a lot of the forage fisheries are being, uh, being fished primarily to produce fish meal and fish oil. The picture on the far right is a, a jar of fish oil, a jar of fish meal, and then a jar of some commercial feed and some of it um, in the little, uh, little uh, bowl in front. And this has been posing uh, a number of challenges, both financially as well as uh, some concerns about uh, uh, potentially reducing actually food access to affordable food by people in coastal communities, uh, potentially you know, not instead of contributing to net food security and resilience of the food system, possibly undermining it. But additionally, the feed industry is actually actively looking uh, for replacements to fish meal and fish oil because the prices have been going up. Uh, next click. We've had already some uh, mention of this, I think, in some of the comments you were making, Ta, but this is a, just one graph to show uh, how much of the capture fisheries is actually going into uh, fish meal and fish oil production. So the lower, sort of darker gray is the, uh, the, amount, the percentage of the fish that are going to direct human consumption. The upper part is for fish meal and fish oil. That represents about 25% um, of the catch of capture fisheries, approximately 18 million tons. And uh, 
recent paper by Cassian et al., including the people from UBC that you had referred to earlier, uh, concluded from looking at data from a lot of places that the majority of those fish that are being rendered in fish meal and fish oil are food grade. So that is one of the motivations uh, to try to find a replacement. Uh, but there is a lot of competition for this fish meal and fish oil, which has driven the price up. Right now, aquaculture is using up about 70% of fish meal and fish oil. These are major uh, global commodities. And I probably don't fully understand all the reasons for the price increases, but some of it is just the growing demand from aquaculture because it's growing so fast. And although I agree that there's a lot of uh, interest and a lot of potential with the unfed aquaculture, there is still, though, quite explosive growth going on with fed thin fish aquaculture. So that's part of the demand. But additionally, there's uh, more and more companies that are getting involved in actually taking the fish oil and putting it into human nutraceuticals. For example, I every day take fish oil pills from uh, Nordic Naturals. So the, mar the competition is complex, and the market um, is one um, that is you know, giving signals of higher and higher prices. Uh, so my lab uh, has had some really exciting results combining marine microalgae into diets for tilapia. And we've been focusing on tilapia as a starting point, sort of on purpose. They feed low on the food chain, and in nature, don't, in the wild, actually don't feed on any fish. Um, and there has been um, a, a good effort on the part of the aquafeed industry to reduce fish meal and fish oil in tilapia diets, um, but they're still not completely uh, at zero. We just thought if we could prove, sort of proof of concept, if we could show that we could get fish to grow as well or better and as good performance, uh, with marine microalgae and tilapia, then we could do the work on uh, higher trophic level fish species. And we are doing some work also with trout as a model for salmon, but uh, that's a little bit earlier stage of development. So most recently, by combining two marine microalgae, one that's very high in um, one of the omega-3 fatty acids, another one that's high in the second one and also very protein rich, we were actually able to get tilapia to grow and have equal performance to a conventional uh, tilapia diet. Um, in an earlier study where we used, uh, we were just replacing um, the fish oil, uh, we actually got better performance um, of the fish. And we're playing a new set of studies where we think we can maybe even get better performance with this fish-free diet. But because we want to take a systems approach, we're also asking the question, and I think that this, this is an example of the bigger systems questions that I think need to be asked for all the issues that other panelists are raising. We're also asking the question, well, how do you raise the microalgae itself in a more sustainable way? And just like all terrestrial plants, microalgae also need nutrients. They need fertilizer. And presently, most of the large-scale production of marine microalgae, which is some of you in the audience probably know is mostly happening in the sector trying to develop biofuels to commercialization, most of that is relying on inorganic fertilizers, which brings its own set of issues, carbon emissions um, and fossil fuel demand just being one of them. So we conducted a, a systematic search of the literature for uh, widespread available nutrient waste streams and concluded that uh, beer brewery waste is something we should take a really serious look at. Um, much of it is potentially uh, food grade. And uh, it turns out that there's an awful lot of beer brewery waste uh, produced, even just in the United States. We have estimated, using some industry figures of, of brewery production in the United States, that there's something between 62 billion to 3 trillion gallons of brewery wastewater produced per year. So we're in the midst of experiments right now where we're actually trying to figure out how much of the nutrient media that's normally used to raise marine microalgae can be replaced uh, by brewery wastewater. And we're finding that about half the time, this is based both on literature values and some of our sampling of breweries um, in New England, we're finding that about half the time the brewery wastewater has more phosphorus than you need for the microalgae, and about half the time it has more nitrogen than what you need. So this isn't going to be a silver bullet solution if this works out, but it would be one way that you could reduce some of the, the needs for inorganic nutrients. So it would beg the question, of course, of potentially combining it with other nutrient waste streams. Last image, please. I did want to put in a plug. Uh, one of the other hats I wear, um, in addition to being a faculty member at Dartmouth, is uh, I'm uh, one of the editors-in-chief of a completely open access journal called Elementa, Science of the Anthropocene. It's a nonprofit journal. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Sustainably Transitions Domain. And we have a forum that we opened recently 
um, encouraging submissions of manuscripts on food, energy, water systems, opportunities of the nexus, <coughs> exactly the kinds of issues that you're all discussing at this symposium. And in fact, one of your presenters yesterday, Marcia Delange, who I know well uh, because I chair the board of directors of her organization, Union of Concerned Scientists, Marcia has a paper pu published in here. So to sort of add to the plug that all of you made to encourage these young people to get involved in these issues, I also encourage you to submit your papers to uh, publications like this where they can easily be read by everybody in the world. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists for the detailed introduction. So I think both Ta and Robert touched upon um, the differences between fisheries and aquaculture and whether aquaculture is a complementary force or a substitute for fisheries. So I'm hoping that you all can um, dive into that and talk a little bit more about the trade-offs between capture fisheries and aquaculture and what the social, environmental, and technological implications of the emerging aquaculture sector are. You first. Okay, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take that on. Um, so, uh, yeah, this be, being on this panel actually made me grapple with this because I, I don't live in the aquaculture world all that much. I'm more on the commercial fishery side, but um, it is an interesting interplay. And, and you know, I live in Maine. Uh, the lobster industry has pretty much taken the helm of the Gulf of Maine fishing industry because of the collapse of the ground fish stocks and the non-recovery, in particular, of the cod stocks in Maine, which seem to have gone over a threshold of some kind. But the lobster fishery industry itself is, a, is an interesting, I see it as a hybrid between capture fisheries and aquaculture in that it's well acknowledged now that we are actually feeding those lobsters, right? That we are responsible for a significant part of their growth functions. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I also see firsthand up in Maine efforts to reduce or uh, convince people to leave those fisheries. And I think it's a, it's a far harder sell if they're the alternative to being in the fishery, for people who've been in the fishery for generations, uh, to tell them to go and work in construction or work at a call center or leave Maine altogether, because there really aren't that many other opportunities, um, to tell them, look, here's, a, here's another uh, rapidly growing industry. Uh, it requires a lot of the same skill sets. You can live where you live, uh, and you can be part of the same community. I think there's a, there are um, strong advantages there to it being a complementary source, or at least a way of of, you know, economists describe that as increasing the elasticity of supply of labor in the fishing industry. Right? We give them somewhere else to go, uh, and there's much less resistance then to, to regulatory constraints on them. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm particularly addressing the question, but uh, I think there is a, a there, many of the aquaculture uh, operations uh, require some management, but they still take advantage of the same kind of natural ecosystem to feed the stocks. And so there's, I think there's a lot of interplay between the two. Yeah, <clears throat> I think one thing is uh, we want to avoid when talking about this issue, or I try to avoid, is the, a choice, that there is a mm -hmm. choice between fisheries and aquaculture. Um, the reality is we're going to need both. We really don't have a choice about it. We need well-managed fisheries, and they play a really important role um, around the world in, in uh, production of, of food for some of the poorest people and nutrient-deprived people around the world rely upon fisheries. It's really important. Um, aquaculture is clearly, you know, only becoming increasingly important. So that's a, you know, a growing sector of increasing importance. Um, fisheries and aquaculture interactions are quite interesting. I mean, some, th some things might be obvious, like fisheries and aquaculture are both seafood products for the most part. They compete on the same market. And for that reason, fishermen, a lot of fishermen um, have, sometimes have a negative perception of aquaculture. Um, you know, there's well-known examples of how, uh, you know, the aquaculture coming online has decreased wild prices. So, for example, the Gulf of Shrimp, Gulf of Mexico shrimp fishery, the wild shrimp fishery, uh, you know, has been experiencing decreasing prices because mostly of cheap wild imported shrimp. Um, you know, and then on the other side, on the day-to-day -day thing, you know, fishermen and aquaculture interacting in... Uh, a specific location. Um, sometimes fishermen see aquaculture as a, sw uh, as a threat, you know, to their business because it's not the way things were done in the past. And there are fishermen that see it that way here throughout the Northeast. I worked on commercial fishing boats. Uh, that was my, you know, for NOAA as a fisheries observer. Uh, that was the first job I had at a college. And 
you know, a lot of fishermen have a negative opinion of aquaculture. But there are others that are seeing it as an increased opportunity for to bring income streams into their communities. Regulations are really only getting tighter. It's getting harder and harder to be a fisherman in most of the Northeast communities. Um, ch climate change, another driver, perhaps less consistent harvests of the species they got used to harvesting. Um, so there's actually really good examples of fishermen transitioning into aquaculture, being innovative and in adopting this as a new practice. In Maryland, for example, um, a few dozen fishermen, uh, watermen in the bay, have undergone training by Oyster Recovery Partnership uh, and University of Maryland to learn aquaculture techniques, to grow oysters instead of harvest them from the wild. And there's a number of commercial fishermen that are now successfully running aquaculture businesses. So I think really the devil's in the details is about how it's done, um, but it can be complementary and can even benefit fishing communities if done well. Well, I'll weigh in a little bit. I, I would agree that it really has to be complementary, and in fact, historically, it has been uh, complementary, and it seems to me that that's, that's the way it's gonna have to continue. And let me just add one other dimension of the food situation that I think would maybe help us see that we probably don't want to completely stop having all humanity get some of its, um, some of its uh, protein and food from, from uh, capture fisheries. A significant part, actually, of the ingredients right now in the industrial aqu aquafeeds are terrestrial crops, soy, um, both, both soy meal and soy oil, corn and cornmeal, and, and other things like canola. And there's, an, there's interest in eventually maybe trying to lower those, too, because in some cases they have anti-nutrients and they're not as digestible. For example, they have forms of phosphorus that are not as digestible. But I think it's going to be hard. It's going to take a lot more work to you know, get to the point that those are really lowered a lot. And it may be that we will be relying on those terrestrial crop ingredients for a long time for the manufactured feeds. So if we were to shift completely from capture fisheries to aquaculture, this is just looking at the, at the higher trophic level, the fin fish. I'm setting aside right now the unfed things, the, the mollusks, et cetera. If we were to shift completely to uh, aquaculture, we probably would increase our demand on essentially the terrestrial linkage. And then that raises questions about you know, whether you're really having a net increase in food production and also in whether or not you're improving the resilience of the food system as a whole as whether you're, whether you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. And then I think the other thing that's important to realize is if you look at something like tuna or salmon, these migratory species that migrate long distances in the ocean, from an ecological perspective, they're really marvels because they are just incredibly efficient organisms at swimming these large areas and essentially harvesting foods that are produced by the solar driven system. And you know, I would argue that it's really worthwhile for us to restore those fisheries and to um, maintain the ones that are not in real trouble yet because that really does add resilience to the food system. And I think if we shift too much of our aquaculture to mostly raising those higher trophic level species and think that we can sort of get away with not having the wild roaming populations, we might find that we're going to get into some, into some trouble in terms of if we just look at the energetics of it. Um, and for a long time, I've thought that we would be better off if we could actually steer a lot of aquaculture more toward raising lower trophic level species, the tilapias, milkfish. You know, in Asia, this is historically was not as much of a problem because China had perfected the polycultures of these carp species that do feed much lower on the food chain. Uh, unfortunately, even in China, though, that has the trend has been to shift more towards eating higher trophic level fish species. But where I'm going with this is I think that at least my ideal world would be one where as aquaculture grows, it focuses more on fish that are feeding lower on the food chain. We do our best to make the diets both as digestible as possible and kind of reduce the, the life cycle impacts of the diet ingredients. Um, and we really work to restore wild fish populations, recognizing that in some cases they actually harvest the food resources of the planet, perhaps in you know, pretty elegant, efficient ways, and we might not be as good at doing it than them. To go back to your question that you said in your, in your comments, Todd, about wondering why we don't 
we don't go hunting for tigers and things like that for food. I mean, in general, anyway. And, and or even the turkeys I see in the streets of the <laughs> suburban exactly. streets. Exactly. So why aren't we? Why, you know, why there may there that? there may be an, a sort of built-in energetic reason why terrestrial livestock agriculture evolved to primarily raising animals that are either directly grazing on grass and or, or can be fed these grains. And uh, you know, there have been some interesting discussions about this in the literature in, in aquaculture because. Uh, you know, the origins of aquaculture, if you look at places like China where it originated, they were not actually raising higher trophic level species. So for centuries, they were primarily focusing on these lower trophic uh, level fish species. It's really a fairly recent phenomenon that we've started raising on very large scale, things like salmon, trout, and now people who are um, trying to, uh, who are bringing uh, tuna into captivity. So I'm, I guess I'm just a little skeptical about whether that is a trend we want to continue to encourage. And I think we might be better off really in a very sort of strategic way encouraging healthy capture fisheries and sustainable and healthy uh, aquaculture. And the final point I'll make about that is it's important to realize that there's so much species diversity of fish as well as a lot of our bivalves and seaweeds. And I'm discovering this with marine microalgae. So, you know, although aquaculture right now, if you look at it globally, is actually pretty diverse in terms of the number of species it raises, the ones that are really the important markets, it's become, you know, consolidated and that's narrowed down to a, a sort of small handful of species. But this is another reason why I think it's really valuable to um, not think of aquaculture as a replacement for capture fisheries, because I don't think we'll ever be able to replace the just incredible biodiversity of species that we can get from waters, and that's both ocean as well as, as fresh waters. Great, uh, thank you. So you just mentioned a little bit about um, the diversity of sh fish species across the world, and I want to transition to talking about uh, regional differences because the sector of both capture fisheries and aquaculture is very complex, and the practices differ region to region, even in terms of, for example, um, fish intake as a source of protein. If you look at the average American, it's typically around 5%. If you look at some local communities in West Africa, it can be well over 50%. So that's a pretty big disparity. So I'm hoping that all of the panelists can elaborate on um, the differences in um, not only aquaculture practices in the developed versus developing world, but um, fisheries projects. I know, Ta, you've worked on a project in the Dominican Republic, and you've worked on many projects in Maine. Um, Wally, you can talk a little bit about the Global Aquaculture Alliance, because they work on um, certification programs um, internationally. Well, let me, a couple of comments picking up on some of the other remarks that have been made. First of all, there is an exemplary program in the state of Maine called Working Waterfronts, uh, where they're merging the work of the commercial fishermen and aquaculture people. And uh, the state of Maine is the leading state in the United States in terms of integrating aquaculture in a responsible way into, in my estimation, into their activity. I started there 30 years ago uh, and Atlantic salmon, raising Atlantic salmon in Maine. And trust me, it was a different climate, a different environment 30 years ago than it is today. The one thing that has not changed in 30 years is the advocacy and the regard and the support for aquaculture in the United States of America. There is very little advocacy, support, uh, and in fact, there is regulatory restrictions that result in us producing about 1% of the global supplies of aquaculture. Until we, we figure out that we care about aquaculture, or maybe we overcome one of the concerns through technology of land-based aquaculture, we're not, you, your careers are not gonna be in the United States worrying about aquaculture. They're gonna be out someplace else. And someplace else today, maybe in Southeast Asia, but someplace else in this global community has got to be Africa. We are going to see a tremendous swing in market baskets of the world where fish is produced and where it is consumed, where more and more of that present production is going to go to China. It's going to go away from the EU and the UK. And the natural market basket for the EU and the UK is Africa not only for their own populations, but also for their marketplace interests. So uh, again, how do, how do we introduce uh, appropriately, responsibly, aquaculture uh, into the continent of Africa for their own purposes 
uh, and for uh, export. That to me is the exciting opportunity and the, and the important opportunity in this, what is a very global community where we produce it, where we, where we consume it. I wish we would produce more in the United States, not gonna happen real quick, uh, but we're gonna, uh, unfortunately we don't consume as much as we should either. Our consumption of seafood last year in the United States went down. Hmm. One of the healthiest proteins you can eat, consumption of seafood went down. Uh, salmon was the biggest decrease in per capita consumption. Canned salmon uh, was the principal driver of that. We, we, we talk about important issues, we talk about the health benefits of seafood, and yet we don't act upon them uh, necessarily here in the United States. And like it or not, China is. The volume of product that used to come into the North American marketplace, EU, UK, is going to China. And unless we implement with the governments and the marketplace forces in China practices that regard and respect responsible practices, we, we got some challenges ahead of us uh, as an industry. That's, that's where we, we think a lot about is how do we influence the important decision makers who need to make sure that things that come to their consumers are safe, they've been produced in a responsible, responsible way. So, Global, it is. Um, aquaculture is going to continue to grow at that five to six percent level as long as we have some technological solutions. Feed is no longer the restrictor, and it won't be. But feed companies are by far the most consolidated business segments mm -hmm. of the aquaculture community. Right. The opportunity to influence feed companies is really immense. You know, whether it's through academia, through research. Whatever, whatever it may be, because at the end of the day, the highest cost of producing aquaculture is feed. So everybody has a, the same inherent interest in seeing alternatives, lower cost feed. Uh, and so I, I just think there's, from a business point of view, there are a lot of, a lot of opportunities for people to get into this space and work on solutions rather than building walls, which early on there were walls between the commercial fisheries and aquaculture. I think they're dissolving because the marketplace is, is making them go away. Yeah, I agree, uh, Wally, with your assessment of Maine being a great case study for aquaculture in the US and probably one of the few places um, that's a real bright spot for the industry and it's on the upswing. Uh, but by and large, you're you're right, we're a country that's chosen to import our seafood. 90% of the seafood consumed in the US is imported. We have a $15 billion trade deficit every year. Um, so we're importing seafood from overseas and essentially exporting our environmental footprint. Seafood's one of the most, is actually the most globally traded commodity there is mm -hmm. out there. Um, so, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, shorting supply chains, growing food locally. There's a compelling reason to be doing more here in the US if you're thinking about this uh, food and from an environmental perspective. Um, you know, and it's not a commonplace thing here in the United States. There's, you can't, you know, we probably, most Americans probably have a memory of going to a petting zoo or a farm when they were a kid, but most Americans don't have the same experience with aquaculture. Uh, Tonight, I'll be leaving to go to Indonesia to visit one of our project sites, and aquaculture is very commonplace there. I mean, 50% of the people living in the villages we're working with are, get their primary source of income from aquaculture. Um, so it's, you know, in Asia, aquaculture is very common. Um, you know, they're, they've tended towards fish for their primary source of protein and some other, you know, pork in some places as well. Here, you know, we're, we lean towards, you know, poultry, pork, beef, um, rather than fish. So, yeah, I think um, the U.S. is not alone in this. Europe as well um, has a heavily regulated industry, not pretty tepid growth there, excluding Norway. Um, and and, and that's, that's the way it is at the moment. Great, uh, we'll open up to the audience now for questions. So if anyone has any questions, you can um, walk up to the mics. 
Well, uh, my name is Dr. Karen Weber. My work was in maritime fisheries, but I have not been in the industry for a number of years because I've been a community organizer to try to increase awareness about the environment. This has been fantastic. Thank you all. Um, I have a couple of questions, and I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. Number one, in terms of the aquaculture, uh, you didn't touch anything on the genetic aspect of um, what they're doing to raise a fish that's sort of a GMO fish. Um, and so what do you see in terms of how that will play out? Because that's always been a concern. You're always going to get escapees. And, and um, in terms of sludge and the waste that's created from the uh, farming of the fish, in that sludge is antibiotics. You also didn't raise any issue about, you talked about disease, but you didn't talk about the prevention. And of course, that's a very high cost. That it's not just the feed that is an input, but the antibiotic. And finally, um, let's see, in terms of the acidification of the oceans, no one's touched on the concern of what's happening. This is, I mean, a major, major issue for all waters is the acidification and the concern that our shellfish and any bony fish will not be able to produce, the, will not have the calcium ability to um, reproduce. So three questions for you all. Thanks. I'll take the genetics one, since that was what I did for about 25 years. Uh, well, first <coughs> of all, uh, important to realize that there's, in the last 30 to 40 years, there's been pretty sophisticated uh, work to apply selective breeding in aquaculture. Uh, the salmon breeding program of Norway is probably the most celebrated and most known one. And, uh, and that has played a very important role in uh, improving growth rates and especially also food conversion efficiency. There's been some work on trying to uh, improve disease resistance, and that's been a little bit harder to do, but um, it is an area of, of work. And, uh, there's an organization called the World Fish Center, which is one of the CGIR centers, Consultative Groups on International Agriculture Research, headquarters in Penang, Malaysia. Uh, I know them quite well because I was on their board for a long time. And uh, they were involved in launching a major program for selective breeding of tilapia, <coughs> uh, which ended up initially benefiting primarily uh, uh, farming of tilapia in Asia, but starting about 10 years ago, they really got to work on essentially returning to Africa because that's where actually the, the main farm tilapia species now tilapia come from, returning the benefit. And so they're very actively involved in actually helping to responsibly grow aquaculture in Africa, including um, the uptake of these genetically improved farm tilapia, which are called the gift. So, just sort of people need to know kind of the backdrop that uh, this has been kind of one of the, I guess, positive signs, I would say, of uh, the evolution and the development of aquaculture. And there are, you know, there are big teams, both in academia and in the private sector, who are using some of our most um, up-to-date uh, molecular genetic techniques, genomics, marker assisted selection, et cetera, uh, to improve uh, traits through essentially selective breeding programs in aquaculture. Uh, there's been, of course, a lot of attention in the news about the um, aqua bounty salmon, which was the first uh, genetically engineered through uh, recombinant DNA methods line of salmon that uh, have been approved by the FDA for sale in the United States. Uh, there hasn't yet been um, approval for producing them in any aquaculture operation in the United States. Presently, they're being farmed in a somewhat undisclosed location in the highlands of Panama, uh, which has, the FDA has, has concluded is a very contained facility. Um, there has been some debate about that, and it's hard to get real good info on it because uh, it's not very publicly accessible. But I think that the FDA understands that uh, if these kinds of fish are going to be used more, that they are going to have to find ways to have multiple levels of confinement uh, to grow them. I think it remains to be seen whether that form of genetic uh, intervention is really going to become a major part of aquaculture or whether uh, it's both sort of financially easier and there's still plenty of opportunity in selective breeding. Because even though I started my comments by saying that you, you all need to know that there is sophisticated selective breeding going on, you also need to know that it's at very, very early stage compared to, for example, what's been done with 
our terrestrial crops and some of our livestock. So there's a lot of gain, essentially, that could be gotten um, through selective breeding methods and especially informed by our molecular genetic tools such as genomic tools. So I think it's an open question whether we're going to see more uptake of genetic engineering. Of course, now with these brand new techniques, um, CRISPR-Cas, where it's even easier to modify a very targeted gene, uh, we're already seeing research and stuff in the academic literature on doing this with everything from, I believe some people are doing with shellfish to finfish, and I fully expect that there'll be at least research and development in that um, area. Uh, there are aspects of these aquaculture species that um, lend them well to those kinds of genetic manipulations, but I think it's really an open question where that's really going to go. I'll let somebody else do the antibiotics and acidification. I'll, I'll speak the antibiotic one um, uh, comment. Um, there has been a tremendous decrease in the use of antibiotics. There's still too much use of antibiotics. Uh, in some parts of the world. Uh, we're spending an inordinate amount of time trying to catch people uh, through testing, quarterly testing of their production to find residual amounts. But there are some antibiotics that are appropriate for animals. Part of our concern is animal welfare. And animals who, for some reason, that become ill that can be treated with appropriate antibiotics, uh, we, we clearly very much uh, support that. We also recognize there are some antibiotics that are not appropriate for use and that have been used. We do not support that. FDA does the best they can to catch that on imports, but uh, the private sector is going to have to do a lot more. The marketplace is frankly going to have to do a lot more on antibiotics. I think we're going in the right direction. A lot of them now are lice issues on salmon, uh, et cetera. Uh, in terms of uh, climate change, uh, it's certainly impacting the west coast of the United States in terms of oyster production, where it takes place. Oyster production is moving further and further north on the west coast of the United States. Um, we're seeing dramatic changes in where lobsters come from on the east coast. Uh, you won't find many south of Cape Cod uh, anymore. They're going to really be in the Gulf of Maine and moving further, uh, further north. Uh, there is significant issues with water temperature, um, which is uh, a key factor in the growth of, of these animals and where, whether they're wild caught or they're farm raised, where they're going to be grown. So again, it's going to get, ultimately technology is going to be a critical component on controlling some of these variables that allow us to have healthier animals, produce them closer to the marketplace where they need to be produced uh, to provide greater predictability uh, for investors to get into this space. Uh, we're, still, we're still not quite in the Wild West, but mm -hmm. we're closer to the Wild West than we are to a mature uh, industry. Any other That's questions? Opportunity. Um, so my question specifically about plastic pollution in the ocean, um, so it's kind of a good segue, I guess. Okay. Um, do you see plastic pollution as a major threat to forms of ocean fishing, whether that's like offshore cages or um, capture fishing, in terms of yields and consumer health? And since the ocean is so hard to clean up, do you think that onshore aquaculture is a viable solution to the problem? And if not, what are some solutions to the problem? Uh, typically, we don't think of aquaculture as a primary source of contributing to marine and global pl plastics, although it is a problem. Like, for example, in Indonesia, there is a lot of, in the seaweed industry, a lot of polyethylene ropes that are used, and those are ending up in the marine environment. Floats as well, those end up in the marine environment too. Um, is land-based, just taking land-based aquaculture as a solution, um, apart from the pollution issue, but there's other reasons why you might want to do aquaculture on land. I think we're ma there's been a lot of strides towards um, the economics and improving land-based aquaculture, um, especially, I think, some of these newer techniques like recirculating aquaculture, mm -hmm. where you're using a closed system to produce fish. Uh, you can filter and control the growing environment. Um, they're becoming increasingly, I guess, attractive um, opportunities to pr have moved towards trying to do that at scale, like very large scale land-based uh, 
recirculating farms. Um, there's some in, in Europe that are doing that for, um, for uh, salmon. Um, but by and large, you know, so I think that is a solution. I think that is important, but really we're gonna need a combination of ways of producing seafood from aquaculture to meet the demand for increased demand from seafood. Um, if you really look at uh, the opportunity with aquaculture, I think of the marine environment. 70% um, of our planet is oceans, but it's mm -hmm. only accounting for 2% of our food. So really, uh, you know, my mind immediately goes towards the marine environment for the big opportunity for producing more seafood. Yeah, and it's gonna require that same type of technology that was shown earlier where that cobia farm uh, from Panama had the floating system. That's the, a pretty impressive structural uh, site, cage system that can be sunk, can be raised, you can feed. I mean, there's a lot of science and technology that, that's gone into that. There's a lot more opportunities to do more of that, whether it's recirculating systems, land-based systems, deep water, uh, deep water system, but you're right. I think it's gonna be a, a blend of, uh, of all of these uh, activities in order to keep up with the demand that, that we're seeing for aquaculture. I, let me just add one thing. I, I, I think it's also important for the audience to know that there is also a nascent emergence of ecological approaches to aquaculture systems, including these cage culture systems. So one very interesting innovation is called uh, IMTA, or Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture. Uh, and it's been taken up by at least one major commercial producer. Uh, it's sort of, is, I, I think of it as sort of back to the future in that it's sort of adopting uh, ways of integrating things such as um, mussels that are hanging on um, um, from rafts around a salmon cage and then also having uh, macroalgae that can absorb some of the nutrients and maybe some um, other shellfish that would be growing in the bottom areas below a cage. And I think of it as back to the future because it's taking that polyculture approach, which was really perfected by the Chinese, which is where aquaculture actually started. Uh, so uh, I think that both for offshore and even in indoor systems, if we do recirculating systems, there are really important opportunities for closing loops and sort of linking systems together including, you know, if you're gonna do a lot of indoor recirculating aquaculture, which my lab, by the way, relies completely on that kind of recirculating system for our work, you have to think about where's your energy source gonna be from for, uh, for the pumps. So, you know, linking up with innovations in renewable energy will be very important. Uh, when we use our recirculating aquaculture systems, we are able to recirculate the water many, many times, and we rely basically on cultivating uh, two types of soil bacteria that nitrify the ammonia waste that the fish release. But at some point, we have to backwash and get rid of some of that, um, some of that wastewater. And that wastewater is rich in nitrates, which is a perfect fertilizer for, for plants. So that's actually part of why you see growing interest and in, 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 um, investments in aquaponics. I think we'll see more of that. But there are also opportunities to actually integrate land-based aquaculture with soil-based agriculture. Um, and in fact, the World Fish Center refers to that as integrated agriculture aquaculture. And there are operating examples of that in everywhere from Malawi to China. Um, so I think that um, I would like to, at least I would like to encourage this audience to think about ways to use technologies and strategic ways that also draw on uh, sort of ecological principles. Because um, I think that that's an area that aquaculture this sort of more modern approaches to aquaculture have barely touched, and we're really behind what I see uh, in the innovations I've been seeing in the agroecology area. I think we could learn from some of those ideas and sort of marry those ecological approaches with these new technologies. Uh, one, just one thing along this, I think there, just to add on to the excitement about some of these opportunities, I think there are economies of scope that could be achieved, not just within agricul agriculture and aquaculture, but with offshore wind farms and aquaculture operations, right. or with, uh, a lot of farms now are renting out, leasing out space for solar farms, but under those solar panels, you can grow shade tolerant crops like lettuce and things. So I think there are a lot of uh, interesting outside the box complementarities that could be achieved and we're sort of at the leading edge of that stuff. So it's an exciting time in that regard. Next question. <laughs> Um, there's been a lot of uh, interesting ideas about how to meet the demand, but I'd be kind of curious to hear more about um, informing demand and kind of like one thing that comes to mind is like 
the uh, Marine uh, Stewardship Console certification, which seemed like pretty promising. And then I saw that McDonald's was putting commercial saying that they were using MSC certified fish, which makes me raise an eyebrow. Can you speak so, up? We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, Better. speak closer okay. to the microphone. Yeah. Okay. So, so just to repeat, um, basically, instead of just choosing to meet demand, how can we better inform demand, particularly around consumer standards that are actually reliable and kind of certify what they claim to certify. And the case example for this would be like whether or not McDonald's is actually using good seafood by saying that they now use MSC certified um, in their fish fillet or whatever. Um, and I'd be curious also, aside from the US, um, has there been any other really promising consumer um, education uh, initiatives around the world mm -hmm. as to how they can eat more sustainably when it comes to seafood? While we eat we we uh, half of what this. the FDA r recommends we eat for seafood. We eat one serving a week. The FDA recommendation is two. It's been two for quite a, quite a few years. So FDA's message has not resonated uh, yet with the American consumer. So much of consumption is cultural. It's uh, you know, regions of the world uh, that culturally consume, uh, live in the coastal areas and consume uh, tremendous amounts of of seafood, um, the United States is still in that 15 pounds per capita range of seafood has been there for quite a few years. So um, we've tried generic marketing. The seafood industry in the United States does not fall under the Department of Agriculture uh, as do the other protein products. So generic marketing programs have worked, I guess, to some extent for beef and chicken and Maybe sugar, I don't know, uh, but for uh, other other products, fisheries says falls under commerce. So that's again one of the challenges that we faced for years in this industry is advocacy for the fisheries and for aquaculture. Aquaculture falls under ag, but the fisheries falls under commerce. So you've got again even with our own government, two agencies involved with with uh, uh, the fisheries. So. I, 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 we're, we're on a campaign in our organization, take a pledge, everybody eat two servings of seafood a week. Uh, we have 42,000 people so far uh, out of 300 and some million in the United States. We've got a long way to go. I wish I had a better answer. I mean, I'll just add a little bit. I, I have not as up on it as I should be right now because it's moving pretty fast, but there are a lot of different certification programs underway. Um, both for fisheries and aquaculture. So Marine Stewardship Council was sort of the first one, but there's a bunch of others and there's parallel efforts underway and some of which are you know, being implemented for aquaculture. There's the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, um, which was sort of designed to kind of build on what had been learned from the Marine Stewardship Council. But there, the Global Aquaculture Alliance has certification standards for, doesn't it? Yeah. So there, there's, uh, there's our program, the best aquaculture practices, there's the Aquaculture Stewardship Council that does certification. Uh, there's the Marine Stewardship Council that does certification. And if you do surveys to say, do you recognize the mark? Maybe 15, 20% yeah. of the people recognize the mark. You know what the mark means? Radiation free. They have no clue. There is, we are so far away from, yeah. from the true. consumer understanding. Our, our perspective is, Let's get the business community, the retail people, comfortable with assurances that their seafood is safe, it's responsibly harvested, uh, the animals are being treated responsibly, et cetera, et cetera, and let the marketplace uh, do a better job of marketing uh, themselves in seafood. For, take it, for us to take it on uh, as a campaign, uh, we, we've had very little success. Uh, we'll take a question up here. I had a question for Dr. Kapusinski. Um, you mentioned the microalgae and finding the, um, mm -hmm. the most promising source for these brewery, the wastewater streams from the breweries. <clears throat> um, I was wondering if you had explored more diffuse pollution sources like from agriculture or more uh, non-point sources like that and whether if you hadn't considered them viable, was it a question of cost? Was it a question of the quality of the algae? Just if you can walk us through some of these yeah. other sources. I mean, we were, there's actually a lot of um, 
both operational and sort of inherent financial obstacles to closing loops that way. So if you were to use non-point source sources, you know, runoff from agriculture, like you're making it almost impossible to really make this work um, because you, you know, you would have to you basically have to, you're much better off having like a pipe of somewhere that's delivering the wastewater. So in the case of the brewery, we can literally go into the brew house and before they 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 send their water in a pipe to where it's going to go for wastewater treatment, we can collect it from the pipe. Uh, plus, we know a lot about what went into the brewery production system, so it's a little bit easier to assure uh, food grade and food safety. When we did the literature review, we ended up actually ruling out a lot of possibilities, such as tertiary treated wastewater, um, even if it's anaerobic digested, because we couldn't convince ourselves that you completely remove the concerns about uh, human pathogens, including some um, some viruses and then also heavy metals, et cetera. So I don't know if there's real potential of doing this with, um, with non-point source solutions. I think you're better off finding sources like brewery wastewater where, it, interestingly, in that industry too, wastewater treatment is one of their biggest costs. And they are very interested in finding something else to do with that wastewater. So we have one of the largest breweries in the United States that actually is agreed to work with my, with my group on one of our pending grant proposals um, because there's, it, it would be a huge savings for them. And I'm sure they'd also like the kind of marketing um, story that they'd be able to say about if it worked out. We're just beginning the experiments to see um, whether when we add this as the nutrient source, what it'll do to change the um, nutritional quality of the microalgae. Uh, so you have to sort of stay tuned for that. You know, sort of on the basic biological and chemistry perspective, it shouldn't, it probably should not, I would hypothesize that it would not reduce the nutritional quality of the microalgae, but I'm actually kind of curious if there's maybe some trace nutrients in the brewery wastewater that might be beneficial, but there could also be something in there that is, you know, for example, not quite an anti-nutrient, but maybe something that actually suppresses the growth of the microalgae. We've done two very preliminary experiments just to see could we grow microalgae in the brewery wastewater, and we didn't see any sign of growth suppression. They grow really well. So now we're about to start a much more um, carefully designed experiment where we're replacing different components of the nutrient media, and we're actually going to look at the composition of the microalgae um, that are grown with brewery wastewater versus grown on the normal, normal media. Uh, but if this idea works, it's going to then, there's a whole bunch of other issues that will have to eventually be dealt with to actually encourage co-location or nearby location of breweries and microalgae operations. So the technology is interesting, but we've got to be realistic about some of the other logistical constraints. And, you know, eventually this is going to get you into some interesting questions in the policy arena. Oh, we have time for the last two questions. Okay, I'm sorry, there's sort of two here, but you can pick and choose. Because aquaculture is more controlled or contained than, um, than fishing, is there a way to reduce the risk of heavy metal contamination in of farm fish, like methyl mercury, et cetera, in comparison to wild caught fish? And you guys have alluded to it a little bit in, in terms of technology, but can you, talk a little bit more about who's doing the technology innovations right now that you're most excited about in this industry. Thank you. On contamination, uh, yes, it, it does mean since you're operating in a controlled environment, you do have more ability to control the inputs um, but I'd caution that, um, you know, we have a nutritionist here and it's all about the feed, right? And if you have feed that's coming from forage fish that have methyl mercury, methyl mercury in them, then your aquaculture product will also have methyl mercury. And that's actually, you know, that's been kind of the case with the, the literature in this area um, has shown that there have been aquaculture feeds that have resulted in fish having methyl mercury, but by and large, um, it, that is, present, does present an opportunity for, for uh, aquaculture. Um, but the whole, with the whole mercury thing, um, you know, it's common knowledge at this point that the benefits of eating seafood far outweigh the health risks and the selenium that is in fish counteracts any negative aspect of mercury. <laughs> 
So um, still the bottom line should be eat more fish, um, whether it's wild or, or farmed. Um, and the other question, tech innovations. Um, feed is the really hot topic right now in aquaculture, and I think we really hit on some of the innovative ones. There's a lot of companies that are investing in this area. Uh, for example, an American company by the name of Callista out in Menlo Park um, is getting a lot of interest right now from some really big uh, ag players like Cargill. Um, so that's certainly a really interesting area. Um, systems and systems design, you have some like major engineering and water engineering companies like Veolia that are investing in, in salmon research farms. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, stuff around like environmental monitoring and um, things like that are, I think, are really neat. Like there's a lot of major tech players that are looking into that for aquaculture. Um, I am particularly interested in that from the conservation perspective because I think um, there's a lot of overlap in the uh, business challenges and the environmental challenges with aquaculture. Um, so, you know, monitoring, better monitoring and sensors around farms can help improve the business productivity of these farms, but they can also help us reduce the environmental impacts. So I think that I'm really excited about that stuff too. Any final thoughts from our panelists? Um, I could just add one more in terms of who's innovating. Interestingly, um, a number of firms that were initially fully focused on microalgae for biofuels, you know, for a variety of reasons, began looking for uh, other things that could be re revenue generating with maybe some of the fraction, various fractions that they can get from the microalgae. Because you can, for example, you know, extract um, the uh, the oils that are good for consumption, the ones that, that are high in omega-3 fatty acids, and market those either as nutraceuticals or ingredients for fish feeds. Uh, you can then use the other oils for the, um, for the oil production. And then you're left with what in the industry is called co-product, uh, which is basically the rest of the biomass of the cells with a lot of protein, which turn out to have amino acid profiles, um, at least in some of the species <laughs> we've looked at that work well for aquaculture. So there are companies, for example, such as uh, Solana, which is uh, headquartered in California, but operations in Hawaii, um, that I don't know if they're the only one doing this, but they're among the pioneers that are trying to develop what they're calling a multi-product pathway. And in fact, recently they even also used one of the fractions from their microalgae to produce a sustainable source of ink, sustainable ink. Um, so I think we're gonna see more of that um, is that in that industry that was originally focused on biofuels, they're realizing that there's some really promising markets in aquaculture because of these needs for feeds. Uh, so I guess the message is keep your eyes open for sectors that you wouldn't have thought would be interacting with fisheries and aquaculture that um, are starting to, and we may see more of that. Great, thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you.